Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Northampton Planning Board meeting of June 13, 2024. Um, we're here at City Council, and we're also uh, have a hybrid function via Zoom with a number of participants there. Um, the presenters for the applications are here in person. Um, we have two items on the agenda, one for a uh, site plan review at uh, Village Hill at uh, we can find my 120 Moser Street and a second one, a site plan, a special permit um, at 8 View Avenue. And then the board, after those applications are closed, the board is going to discuss um, some of our protocols that we've started talking about a couple of meetings ago regarding um, the hybrid meeting format. Um, and we might even have some other administrative things at the very end of the such as minutes. But is there a, there is an A&R at Northern Avenue and minutes. So prior to opening up the applications and the official agenda, we traditionally ask people if they'd like to make any public comment, not related to the two items, the two or three items on the agenda, but other items that you're concerned about with the city of Northampton. So we'll start here with council chambers. Is there anyone here who would like to speak publicly about Items they're concerned about, not to do with Moser or View Avenue. Okay, and as we're still in our our format of uh, for hybrid participants on Zoom, we are still taking their comments just by chat at this point. Um, and the staff, Carolyn, Miss, or myself, will read those aloud. And I don't. So, if there's anyone in Zoom who'd like to comment about an item not on the agenda? Please take a moment and put that into the chat. Okay. All right, seeing none, then we'll move right into our agenda items. Um, we're gonna begin uh, with a site plan amendment by Jay, Bri excuse me, Brynus, for addition to a home at 120 Moser Street, map ID 31C-28, permit LU-24-19. And the applicants here, and I think I have a simple, straightforward presentation that you can hopefully see. Um, what we're doing, I, I, I think, what I'm looking for is a permanent amendment. I think. Yeah. Um, you might need to talk so you're facing the mic there, Mr. Brynus. Can I move the mic a little bit? So, yeah. yeah. Am I okay? Yep. Okay. So, um, this is Village Hill, so there's, I guess, some special zoning and permitting up there. And, and so when we applied for building permit uh, a couple of months ago, two months ago, um, it was, we assumed it would be approved, moved quickly, but then I had to go to zoning. There was some confusion at zoning. And we think the confusion was that this was the as planned uh, projection. It was a house with a garage and I guess a uh, work limit line of some sort, which I'm not sure what that is exactly, but that's the line. It went past what was a expected deck, I guess, up here. But we actually built what Mr. Picoy built that we bought from him was this house, which did not have a garage and we moved it back and had an extra room on the first floor and they needed two cars in the alley in the driveway. So this cat was pushed back. So apparently it was pushed back beyond the work line and then this is our basement um, walkout from below. So the, the property really ends here. But we're, there was a deck here that was poorly built and we took it down and we're replacing it with a, a, a screen porch. So we are within the perimeter footprint of what we bought, but it, it deviates from what was presented during planning. And the planning process, as I understand it, the road is there and it's sort of like a, a cookie cutter house put along the line. So what was actually built was changed person by person who was buying the property. They modified it, they asked for this, they asked for that. I don't believe Mr. Pico ever submitted as built to the city. Maybe. And so what happened was the city was using this to look at our request when in fact we have this. So the simple request we have is to allow us to build the, the deck within our footprint uh, that exists really right now. Um, so that's that's the request. The, the house next to us on the side 
comes back the same setback, but yet on the plan was also you know, mm -hmm. identical ones. So in that familiar form in the neighborhood, we're continuing to use the same siding and same everything for the house. So so we're conforming to the village hill kind of um, um, palette, so to speak. Um, anyway, that's basically the issue. So, well, what's the point of the garage thing that you have to come out this? No, no, on the other floor. Well, this one? Yeah. That's the, well, that's what was original. Okay. So when the when the plan, site plans were set out, they said, here's the house, here's okay. the garage, right. Right. and they were all there. We didn't build a garage. We, in fact, yeah. asked Mr. Pequot for this. I don't know where certificate of occupancy has been done, and I'm not sure how that happened, but but the plan, the house that we bought was different than the house that was on the planning. Um, we did not realize that, I guess, when we bought the, the house. So. Great question from the board. So this is a, an amendment to the site plan. Is it a is it a site plan just for that series of buildings on Moser Street, or it's the whole campus? Um. So this is a site plan for our, that uh, amendment from that Moser Street loop. Yep. But just as it relates to this parcel, because we don't have the data about, I mean, some of the houses were built within the work limit line, others were not. Um, but the only way we'll probably know specifically is as people come in over time to amend. And so it, or if, if there's still space between the existing house and the work limit line, then they wouldn't have to do that. Um, but this particular application is just about this lot. What was the, what's the work limit? So the, um, it, it was to sh show sort of the building envelope initially. So there are no setbacks um, in the plan village zone. So the idea was an applicant would come in to, to develop a sec, you know, quadrant of the state hospital and um, show what made sense for that quadrant, then maybe the setbacks would be five feet or 10 feet, um, but that the board essentially granted approval sort of within this building envelope, you can put your structure. And it was to ensure that there was enough leftover land and also understand um, how much would be undeveloped and left for landscaping. The other thing about this particular section of that Mosher Street quadrant is that on this particular line of Mosier Street is um, the farthest west of that state hospital redevelopment. And there were some significant mature trees where it was really important to make sure the work limit didn't come close enough to disrupt the root zone there. And so this lot in particular doesn't have one of those significant trees um, at the back. So, um, but there are some lots further south of this one where those trees were intended to um, remain. And so it was important to make sure that limit line was far enough away to protect it. There's also just 10, 20 feet from the project, there's a severe drop off down into the conservation area, as we call the. Um, so one of my questions is, and I think maybe it was raised in the staff notes, is about now that we're adding that larger roof on there, how that's going to impact the the runoff, the rainwater runoff, and um, does it impact the any kind of stormwater situation that was um, inherent in the existing house before? I don't know if you're... So I, what I can respond to on that level is the entire uh, area that we're building the screen porch is elevated, so it's all stone and dirt below so we're not asphalting or or, or you know uh, enclosing any permeable land and the roof will actually have a gutter and and fit into our storm uh, runoff which has a, a storm pit or whatever it's called in the back they, they built okay. um, the, the drainage stone filled I well uh, yep so our water will actually go to that it won't go it'll be removing water actually that would have gone to the ground. Because mm -hmm. before we had the roof, everything went to the ground. Yeah. Running, you know, yeah. There'll be less water actually um, running off the surface. And there's no open space calculations up there at the planned village either. So the, adding that roof doesn't kind of detract from those open space calculations. 
Other questions? Uh, so we'll open it up to public comment. Is there anybody here in city council who'd like to speak to this application, either in support or in opposition to it? All right, hearing now, we'll turn to our friends in the online. Is there anyone there who would like to uh, enter a chat with a comment about this application? All right, seeing none. You see anything, Carolyn? I do. I have the same view as you. Nope. All right. I move to close the public comment. Second. Motion has been made to close the public comment. Any discussion? All those in favor? All right. Unanimous. Nobody opposed. Okay. Um, pretty straightforward. The only thing I'd like to, I, I move to support. Thank you. I wouldn't move to support this. I just would want something that would designate the fact that this can't later be added, uh, simply added into the envelope of the actual home um, without coming back in front of the, the planning board. But aren't we doing that if we accept the amendment? No, it's a screened in front porch. It's completely different than it's not it's part of the envelope of the house. Uh, well, why, why can't they, I mean, can't you build an addition on your house? Why does that need to come to planning board? Well, first of all, because you don't, that's not how you build a, an addition onto a thing. Uh, well, that's a building code Structure. issue, but I mean. Structurally do that. And, <clears throat> and the question is, would we, would we say, would we support this if it was not just a screen in porch? I'm not saying it's bad at saying it's just a, it's an addition none of us view it as a not a, adding a room to the house just cl to clarify it's on the rear of the house that's not the front so what did I, did I... a rear screened porch yes a yeah. rear screened yeah. porch versus an actual an actual conditioned insulated room so yeah i mean i think you would just discuss that i mean the um from a um, review perspective, we look at the footprint um, and uh, uh, an extension of essentially, no, it's not extending the foundation, but it's an extension of the usable space and the built space. So you're, you would be essentially approving, you're also sort of approving that, um, thanks, the alternate room there that's built beyond the work limit line that's already there. Yeah. So you're sort of approving the whole thing and that's enclosed living space. So I think if the board, uh, I think it's, you know, you could certainly have that conversation about what you think you're ex, um, allowing in terms of an expansion. Um, but certainly from a building code perspective, yes, a porch on piers, obviously it, to turn it into a conditioned space would have to be re built to meet the building code for that. Um, but if the, there was, if it was silent on that piece, I mean, I think you'd want to look at what would be the difference of having an extra room on a house in terms of the impact to the overall state hospital redevelopment in the housing up there, right? Um, if that were to come in for enclosing, you know, later for a living condition space, the building department would look at that and say, well, they've already built there, so they're just really enclosing it. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. So um, they, that wouldn't necessarily in and of itself trigger a need to come back because the board would have already approved the work limit line. So if there's an issue for the board to say it makes a difference whether it's conditioned or not conditioned, then you know definitely you'd want to clarify that because that wouldn't be obvious to, you. Um, to the building department. Yeah. Issue here is just that it's crossing the work limit line yeah. as built situation. I mean, we're not we don't typically review additions in the state hospital right. area just because that people want an addition. Right. 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 Okay. And and are we setting any precedent? I mean, are, we're not changing the work limit line at this point. We're allowing a kind of a waiver and amendment to it, but. Currently, all those other houses on Moser Street still have that work limit line, correct? 
Right. And at some point, there's going to be a threshold beyond which the stormwater management permit that was issued, if the more impervious surface that's built, there might need to be a recalculation by the HOA, the association. They're responsible for maintaining the stormwater system. So we haven't gotten to that point yet, but that's, um, you know, that's what makes this, um, you know, different than other situations. Right. Hey, any other questions for the applicant or staff? Okay, and I don't think we were already closed this, didn't we? We closed up. Thank you. We closed the public comment. Yeah. So we can't. So, Mr. Brian, as you're all set, you could, we're going to kind of deliberate and come to a motion at some point. Thank you. I, I don't have a, I wasn't trying to start something, uh, a dis discussion about it. It's more about the fact that, um, you know, I moved to support the. Yep. Yeah, I, I think a vote for this means that it could be enclosed in the future. Yeah. Okay. All right. I realize there, that there it is. Voting. Yeah. All right. Is there a motion from the board? for this application at 120 Moser Street? I, I, I move to support the uh, the addition of a screen in front porch on, what is it? Okay, Mo 120 Moser Street. 120 Moser Street. Motion's been made for the, to approve the site plan amendment. Second. Thank you. Seconded by David Whitehill. I need more discussion. All right, all those in favor? We're all there again. Okay. Thank you very much. Good luck with your project. Our next application hearing is set for 720. I want we're, to 720. We're right there. What an efficient, an efficient crew. Were you stalling for that, Troy? Oh, okay. Sometimes Did you miss David? Don't work, it's an old Did thing. you miss this fun? David <laughs> actually took. Oh, right. I remember. Chambers. Yes, it looks like it. Are you standing on us? Fingers crossed. Somehow we all missed the memo, though. <laughs> all right. At this point, we'll open up. Your mic. At this point, we'll open up a public hearing for a site plan and special permit by sovereign builders for development of 12 units on a parcel at 8 View Street. Map ID 25C, dash 12 slash 17, permit LU 24, dash 11. And again, we're here in city council chambers with a number of the public, and we're also online at high, in a hybrid setting. Um, and those people online, if they want to comment during public comment, they'll need to, they'll need to put their comments into the chat function. Um, we did have a request from one person who uh, needed an accommodation, um, wasn't able to come to city council chambers. And after discussing this with staff and uh, our ADA coordinator here at city hall, um, we will allow that person to speak for uh, approximately two minutes um, during the comment period. And even though that person's on online, so that's an exception we're making for tonight's hearing. Mm -hmm. As we mentioned later on after the he this hearing is um, cl closed, we will talk about some other protocols that we're putting in place for these hybrid meetings. God, I'm going to have to read the number for you. Hold on. <laughs> The nerve of it. Mm -hmm. To your point. 
Technical difficulties, please stand by. You want to type in? Yeah. Um, 995. Um, 8703. Um, 7174. Wait, that doesn't look like 995. 995. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay, passcode is 6060. Sounds of city life. Hey, you know what? It's cool in here for 85 degrees. The AC is working. Oh, bear with me here. Thanks for your patience, folks. We're just queuing up our presentation. Don't unmute. Don't unmute. Uh, Are you there? Yeah, I, uh, there's yes. Okay. This is a separate window. That you just okay. popped up and closed. And no. Okay, okay, no, stay muted. Yeah, okay. that's what I want you to do. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. All right. That was the shoot. Mm -hmm. Okay, are we there? There. Perfect. Um, we ready? Ready. Okay. Uh, Jeff Squire from the Berkshire Design Group here on behalf of uh, Todd Lure and Sovereign Builders. Um, and then with us also virtually, because he couldn't be here tonight, is Charles Roberts uh, from Kuhn Riddle Architects, who has also been working on the project and will share um, some comments about the architectural component of the project. Um, this. So, Jeff, sorry, we're not going to allow that, right? So I, I contacted him. He knows that he can't present. Ah, yeah. okay. We'll have to type his comments in the chat. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm not prepared to talk too much about the architecture, and we'll just have to figure this out. But it varies. A bunch of the stormwater stuff. It hasn't been... We'll okay. talk about that. Okay. So, um, so this project is on Eight View Avenue. Um, just to make everybody familiar, um, it really comprises uh, two parcels, uh, 25C12 and 25C17. Um, there's some other land that's associated with you know the project, but some of it is being sold off through an ANR and has been developed through different means. So what we're looking at generally is is what you see highlighted here, which is uh, about five and a quarter acres um, with a private drive that extends off of uh, North, North Street. Um, and then it does extend up to a small finger in the north end of the parcel on Northern Ave, the western end of Northern Ave. Um, and then the western edge of the property abuts the, uh, the rail trail, uh, the bike path, and then uh, private property on the sort of the southwest and uh, mm -hmm. southern edges. Um, as you all may know, this is a project or property that, um, at least from Berkshire standpoint, we've looked at um, for a number of developers. Um, we've done um, a number of schemes on this. Um, this property is unique in that it's you know nestled in um, in the URB zoning district, close to downtown, with access to a lot of the um, 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 you know major thoroughfares, um, vehicle and and pedestrian, bike and otherwise. Um, there's a substantial amount of wetlands on the property. The rear western portion of the property um, is is primarily bordering vegetated wetland. Um, there's also, um, you can see sort of highlighted in this heavy blue line, a uh, 200 foot riverfront area associated with um, stream that uh, comes through from the west side and is culverted underneath the bike path and then um, continues to spill out into this into this larger wetland. So really the area that we're you know looking at is this eastern portion of the site. Um, it's maybe a third of the overall land area, maybe a little bit more. Um, it currently contains a single family home. 
um, of about 1,500 square feet. There's a small shed uh, in the backyard, and it's primarily um, just mown, mown lawn that slopes down to um, a number of mature tree plantings, some stone wall remnants um, along the edge of the uh, edge of the wetland. Um, we are seeking a special permit approval for 12 uh, new single family efficiency units um, under section 350.10 and 350.11. Um, it also includes this private drive um, that is view Ave. Um, this is for um, 12, uh, 12 new uh, efficiency units, which I'll describe in a little bit more detail um, in a moment, but this is just some uh, images of the existing site. Uh, so this is looking down view Ave. This is the single family home that exists on the site now. Um, this is the back of the building um, to the right, uh, upper right here in the shed you can see in the background. Um, and then looking around the site through sort of the forested woodlands and wetlands in the back, um, the mown lawn, you can see uh, up to the, um, there's a number of uh, large mature Norway, maple, uh, Norway spruces on the site. Um, and that's what you can see. That's what all these uh, evergreens that you can see in the in the background are. Um, some views of the wetland area, and then um, there's an existing trail system on the northern edge of the property, um, which we'll talk about later. Um, as I noted, the proposal is for 12 new efficiency units on the eastern portion of the site. Uh, it includes an improvement to, to what is view Ave now, and then it branches off into two um, two dead end roads essentially with a uh, small parking area, um, which accommodates 15 cars. There's provision for emergency vehicle turnaround uh, in this space here. Um, but all these units um, back up against that, the, the wetland area, uh, respecting the 35 foot no disturbed limit in this, um, in this zoning district. Um, obviously the majority of this site is either within uh, 100 foot buffer zone or uh, riverfront, and um, you know, understandably, we can't avoid all impacts to to buffer zone, but we are respecting certainly the 35 no disturb and um, any disturbance within the riverfront area. So um, these are um, 12 new units. There's nine units. These small units are uh, 768 square feet. Um, there's nine of those. And then there's three of these larger units, which include a roughly 250 square foot uh, carport, which is really the additional square footage. Those are um, just over 1300 square feet. Um, these are all electric. Um, they will be, um, they've got, uh, and been designed with the appropriate HERS rating, um, based on, you know, zoning requirements for these, this style of unit, uh, type of unit. Um, as I noted, we've got, uh, we've got 15 parking spaces. There are three additional spaces within these carports conceivably. Um, so there's parking for 18 total conceivably with compact cars. You could fit another space in these, in these driveways. Uh, for the larger units, but um, we're, we've, we've said that there's parking for 18 legitimately. There are two um, covered bike storage sheds. Um, there's one at this uh, intersection here, and then further back on the site in this location, um, these are covered bike sheds that each um, can accommodate easily um, three, uh, four bike racks, so eight, uh, eight, uh, eight uh, eight bikes total um, comfortably in each of these um, each of these structures. Um, taking you through some of the um, other details of the site, stormwater and and drainage, um, understandably is is a is a pretty big concern out here given the high groundwater table and the proximity of wetlands. Um, we've maintained essentially the same surface area that is draining um, to the east off of view Ave. the remainder of the site from roughly this high point here um, we branch off into two different drainage areas one for this this lower southern parking lot which is collected through a series of treatment chambers and infiltration um, galleys and then to the north similarly um, we are um, draining to uh, a catch base in the stormwater collection system here, which is a much larger system due to a little bit higher um, elevation and depth to groundwater. So we have the ability to uh, provide uh, some additional underground storage in this location. Um, the roof water is all being picked up 
via a series of um, subsurface pipes that all tie to these same systems. Um, we are also including um, a series of sub drains just in, in recognition of the need to uh, ensure that that you know ground flows and stormwater continues to do um, closely what it's doing now through the site, um, presuming it's it's moving east to west. So there's a series of sub drains uh, around the pavement structure, uh, both on the outside eastern edge and then along the inside uh, sidewalk edge um, to help direct. Um, any ground flows that might be moving through um, and get them through the site so you know we don't create a, uh, an impingement to, to that um, process. Um, there's a small outdoor community space as required by zoning. Um, this is really um, you know a glorified fire pit area. It's it's intended to be um, you know very low impact. It's it's a small fire ring with some seating available around it, um, Adirondack chairs, that type of thing. Um, with a gravel, uh, compacted gravel pad. Um, we're not anticipating that this is going to be this large pavilion, you know, um, concert structure. This is really just a place for the residents to, to gather and have a, um, you know, small, small, um, you know, outdoor activity or something during the, the nicer weather. Um, utility wise, uh, other utilities, water, we are, um, we've been in discussion with the DPW. There's an existing four inch line that extends up um, U Avenue now um, that was um, uh, connected to a new eight inch service that was stubbed out by the city several years ago. So um, we are proposing to um, abandon essentially that, that four inch line, replace it with a new eight inch line to service the site. Um, all the existing services will be connected to that new uh, new eight inch line per DPW request, and then that will continue into the site to service the new units. Um, there's various hydrants um, as as needed and required for um, for flushing and uh, fire suppression needs. Uh, similarly, sanitary. Uh, there is an existing line in view Ave that goes to uh, a certain point. Um, we've agreed to, you know, video that that line ensure it is um, in good, uh, good condition, good working order. Um, essentially, these new units will connect via a gravity system to a, a single ejector pump, which will then connect, um, which will then, you know, via force main connect to uh, a new structure that goes to that gravity service. Um, Provided that's in decent condition. If it's not, um, you know, we've we've obviously got got the ability to replace that or work with the DPW to do what's needed um, to accommodate that. But um, that's sanitary um, lighting. Um, yeah, I think it just in recognition of the location and the you know really the desire to um, not provide any more lighting than is really necessary to safely get people um, through the site. Um, and um, you know, get to their parking areas and to their to their front doors safely. Um, there's four uh, there's four single uh, site poles. This is uh, just an image that's similar to um, what we're proposing, but these are all um, compliant with city regulations, uh, both in terms of dark sky lighting, bug ratings, um, full cutoff. Uh, we did go through um, at least a revision or two to clarify um, some of the extents of, of that photometrics, but um, overall it is it is these you know four single lights. There's one small bollard just at the uh, junction of the this community, you know, fire pit area. And then um, we also included uh, in this plan the photometrics for um, uh, ceiling mounted, there'll be flush ceiling mounted lights uh, at each of the entries and under the uh, bike shelters just for, you know, for general safety there, but those photometrics are also included here, um, but there's no other exterior lighting that was that's proposed on the buildings or uh, on the site. So um, really trying to minimize um, the amount of light, you know, in that in that part of the um, neighborhood and and just um, recognition that it is a dense neighborhood. Um, Planting plan, um, obviously, as I mentioned before, there are a number of um, 
mature Norway spruces on the site. Um, you know, we there are a number that are still depicted here that are going to be preserved, um, but there also are also a number that that will need to come out as a result of the project. Um, you know, we recognize that that's certainly not the ideal situation, but um, you know, I would offer that these are all um, every single one of these is a Norway spruce. Um, all of them are 90, you know, 80 to 90 feet tall and sort of reaching the end of their lifespan. Um, and, um, you know, particularly with those, that tree species, as you start to remove vegetation or as vegetation around these large, um, you know, groves die off, it just creates a, a much larger hazard for the trees that are remaining because uh, they are so big and that the wind throw during, you know, um, you know, heavy wind events has a tendency to, um, to wreak a lot of, uh, of havoc. So, um, you know, those within the limit of work we are proposing to remove, um, those have been accounted for in, um, we did include a tree removal, uh, plan that notes the, um, that notes the tree replacement required, um, what we're able to provide, um, and then obviously the mitigation that's necessary to, to compensate for the difference. But, you know, what is being planted are, um, you know, a number of, uh, you know, tree species, including white oaks, um, we've got, um, we've got plane trees, um, I think there's ironwood, we've got of um, obviously some shadbush and a lankier, um, dogwoods. So there's a number of other species that we're trying to add to the, um, to the mix of, of species out there to diversify that, that woodland area. Um, and obviously a number of, uh, shrub species as well, just to, um, sort of finish out that, that landscape offer buffers, um, you know, where, where they're needed, um, up against the property lines and against property boundaries. Um, there are, there were four, uh, mature spruces here that, um, were recently added to be removed just again, because of negotiations with the budding landowners and concerns about the, um, hazard of those. So in place, you know, we have added additional plantings. We do have some fencing, um, some screen fencing in locations where, uh, vehicle headlights may present, um, a concern. So those are certainly in areas, um, uh, particularly along this edge where, um, headlights are, you know, may, might be a concern. This northerly parking lot um, is less so. This is quite a bit a distance from um, neighboring residences. And then similarly here, um, there are residents to the east, um, but we have, um, you know, provided a number of, of, of plantings in there um, just to, to provide some additional screening and buffer. Um, again, just the tree removal exhibit. What you see in red is what's being proposed for removal. These are all... Um, trees that would fall under the significant tree ordinance. Um, and I think all of these are, um, are Norway spruces, um, but they've been accounted for. And as I mentioned, um, the mitigating, the required mitigation is, is being offered up as, as part of this permit. Um, the project is highlight a couple of other things. Um, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but I know that tree removal is something that is of concern to some of the abutters. So can you just uh, share with everybody the calculation of exactly what's being removed and how much is being replanted versus what's being paid absolutely. into the tree inventory? Yep. Thank you. So of the caliper inches um, that are being removed, the total... Um, the total caliper inches is 777 inches. Um, that requires 389 inches of tree replacement. So it's essentially half of, uh, of the trees that are being removed. Uh, we are able to accommodate uh, 115 inches of, of tree caliper with the new planting plan in, in the areas that we're planting. And so there's uh, 274 inches of, of additional mitigation that's required um, that would be in payment in lieu of uh, planting, so that's certainly offered up as as part of the um, as part of the project. Yep. Um, as I know, just a couple of other uh, things to mention. Oops. Um, that we are um, we are providing a uh, a new accessible sidewalk connection along the northern edge of View Avenue to connect to North Street. Um, this will be a, a paved sidewalk um, to provide, you know, fully accessible access out to the public way. We are also um, we are also um, improving or enhancing. Um, there's an existing trail that um, it's uh, sort of winds through. Um, I'll show you a better. 
So you can see evidence of it here that winds sort of across the backyards of all these properties um, through these through, through the existing wetlands and sort of the drier areas and exits in a couple of locations. There's a very prominent um, connection to the bike path um, through what was formerly a, a sort of a homeless encampment in this area, um, but there's a real obvious connection to the bike path there. There's also a connection that that winds up and around, connects to the end of uh, the western end of, of Northern Ave before it crosses um, this drainage ditch and then the bike path again. So um, as part of this, we are proposing to relocate and enhance that trail um, to you know relocate it to this property where possible um, and then improve it to the extent that it's in a, it, we've established gravel path. There are some elevated portions of boardwalk that we are providing to get through the B BVW portions um, in consultation with the Conservation Commission. Um, so all of that is, you know, we're, we're really trying to make that connection and that existing trail system, um, you know, part of this project and integrate it into the, um, some of the, the pedestrian connections that uh, exist now and, and into the future. Um, what else? This does um, just comment that this does this project does fit um, some of the goals of the Sustainable Northampton Comprehensive Plan, particularly Goal H one, which speaks to providing affordable, high density housing for mixed uh, for mixed incomes um, with small, energy efficient homes, and this certainly achieves all of those um, all of those goals. Um, and then I think finally, I would just speak to traffic before um, presenting some of the architectural drawings. Um, as required, we did provide a traffic uh, traffic uh, mitigation summary. And essentially the, um, you know, the, the summary is that there is one existing single family home uh, that exists there now that would be accounted for. There are uh, a, a 12, New ones that would replace that, so there are 11 uh, additional single-family units, which would generate um, a, 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 an additional 11 vehicle trips during the peak hour. And so that's the mitigation um, payment that's that's offered up as, as part of the mitigation required for, for the traffic increase. Um, it's, you know, it, these, these, this isn't high... Um, High density uh, housing necessarily. These aren't apartments. These are you know small single family um, single family units. Um, and I will try to run through some of these architectural slides and images um, as best I can. And um, if Charles wants to chime in uh, at any point, uh, please interrupt me and let let him go. But. Um, as I mentioned, we we approached this project, um, you know, in in a in a way that really tried to focus and enhance um, the the resource areas on the site and the open space, being cognizant of um, you know the adjacent residential um, homes and and properties, and um, you know not not overdevelop this this property as some of the previous projects that the board has has maybe seen in the in the past. Um, so these are all, um, again, small efficiency units. Um, largest is about 1,300 square feet. Um, that's these three larger ones here, which um, you know are, are larger really due to their um, carport that is below the first floor or the upper floor. And then there's some um, you know additional um, you know living space on the on the upper level. Um, Jeff, I'm sorry to ask you an architectural question, but yeah. what what are those wood slats on the larger units on the roof? In a sense that I think these are these are the spaces above the uh, carports, which are more intended to be uh, three season rooms. So I would imagine that's probably some slatted um, opening in the ceiling to provide some light, some additional ventilation in that space. They're not meant to be. You know, I don't think it's a, a necessarily fully conditioned space. Um, would be my guess. Okay, but we'll let Charles chat. Yep. Yeah. Okay. There's like terraces on some of the unit types. Yes. In the plans. To clarify, is it like a skylight? Eight hundred square feet, three twelve hundred square foot with carports, two bedrooms, two and a half bedroom at the car for the carport units. Um, 
and they're all, all electric flat roofs uh, with universal PV exposure um, and views to the private backyard spaces. When you're cutting down all the trees, we're going to be cutting down. Are you? How I'm sorry. So this is the I mean this is the wet this is looking west. Um so the southern exposure really is you know off of off of this this side of the of the site. Um yeah, I mean there are a number of mature trees in that in that existing wetland area that you know we're certainly not proposing to cut down. Um you know, some of those may limit um, optimal solar exposure, but I, I think the intention is certainly to, you know, have have um, you know solar capacity for any of these units. Um, you can see the small bike shelters um, in this corner, and then uh, again further back on the site. Um, again, just other uh, other views of the site um, from different directions. This one's looking to the east. Um, Again, this is so there's two different versions of these smaller 800 square foot units, um, depending on their orientation. You can see in the site plan that some are oriented sort of the long way um, and some are oriented, you know, horizontally with the with the long edge of the building to the to the sidewalk to the open space. Primarily the differences in the way the interior space is oriented so that in these the narrower um, oriented units. There's you know large glass um, windows um, views out the back um, of the building um, you know offering views of that of that wetland area that open space. This is the second floor um, again two bedrooms um, bath on the upper floor um, large living space open living space on the lower floor um, and then the um, the other unit which again same size same general. Footprint offers um, a long, uh, long open view uh, along the longer horizontal edge. So it offers some flexibility with regards to how we uh, oriented the, the different uh, units on the site. Um, but these are all two bedroom, um, one bath, um, and yeah, less than 800 square feet. These are the larger, um, larger units. And you can see on this ground floor, there's, um, this is the single uh, carport area upper level, um, which you can see, let's see, over over here where the carport is. Um, the upper level is is got this sort of covered deck area on that upper level um, with direct access from that second story um, offering, you know, that, that additional amenity. There's a little bit of additional storage space on that ground floor um, as well. So that's that's one of the benefits of those larger units. But there's there's three of those in general. Um, and these are just some images of um, the bike shed. These show, you know, much more than four um, bike um, uh, bike racks. There's certainly capacity for these at a minimum. Like I said, very comfortably, we can fit, you know, 16, 18 bikes um, in, in these. Um, but these are, um, you know, modest, um, you know, sheltered um, covered areas for, for bike storage and uh, bike pumps, that types of thing. And then these are just a series of images um, walking through the site. And then there's a little video um, that um, that CUNY will put together that I think is a good um, uh, a good introduction to the site as well. So just looking, these are sort of in the south uh, western corner. Um, looking back, the resource areas, the wetlands are behind all of these units. The south part of the property um, is off to the right here. Um, coming around, you can see one of the uh, bike shelters here as you enter. These are one of the units as you come into the site. View Ave is off to the right. Um, road branches off to the north um, and then to the south here um, to the bottom of the page. Um, just sort of the back of the units. Again, we don't anticipate there's going to be much yuck on the wetlands, but the idea that these all face up against, um, you know, that that bordering vegetated wetland and, um, you know, really enhance that open space. Um, Good question. So, and what do we see there? Kind of a wooden patio. Sort of this area here. Patio. So these, I uh, this is what was shown in the um, in this these renderings. There, the site plans don't include that space, so we're not proposing. There's wooden patios or concrete patios outside. Um, these, you know, these 
if you look at the site plan, the the slope does drop off, you know, fairly you know, quickly behind these units. So it's really a space that if somebody wants to put a chair or a lawn chair, they could they could put one. Um right, the patio spaces. No, that's what I'm saying. They oh interesting. Okay. So this may have been just updated recently. Yes. Yep. Um so yeah, I mean intent is that that will just you know bleed off into the into the natural landscape there. Um and then again, just back of the back of the um the back of the units here, and I'll just share this. Uh hold on. Share. This is just a nice um the walkthrough video of the site, which I think um just sort of gives a nice overview of um of the general character that we're we're hoping to accomplish. Again, this is looking south into that that southerly parking lot. Um wetlands are to the right and now behind these these units. You can see the upper decks of the carports. Um <clears throat> and then just moving to the north around that larger loop, um, you know, primarily these these smaller units oriented, you know, the long way and and uh, on the narrow access to provide some some um, diversity. And then around to the end of that upper parking lot where that um, bike shelter is, and then just from the back, again, just getting. Um, getting views in and through, you know, one of the, one of the big goals of this was to provide, um, you know, a lot of open views through the site. Um, and so both between the buildings and then just with a lot of glass on that lower level, that as you come into the site, there are a number of units that actually, you know, offer views, you know, completely through and, and, and to those, um, uh, wetland areas in the back. So trying to make this site as sort of transparent as possible. Um, and not present a you know wall of structure along that edge. So um, with that, I will open it up to yeah. questions. Yeah. So yeah. We'll hold on just for a little bit. We'll open up public comment in a few minutes, okay? And then can I put it to the board? Thanks. Um, uh, can I, Jeff, did you say are you, you're scheduled for the 27th for the Conservation Committee? I saw some, yeah, some chatter on the public portal. I didn't get a confirmation of the okay. date, but if that yeah, that sounds like it would so be. So the end of right? June, I think okay. so. Yeah. yeah. Good. That was one of my questions about input from the Conservation Commission at this point. Yeah. So there hasn't been any. And yeah. we haven't met this first one. Other questions from board members? I just wanna make a general statement for the for the public's awareness. Um, we're the planning board, so we're not the Conservation Commission. Um, we're not really concerned with uh, the different buffer zones or anything in relation to conservation areas, right? So we're looking more about the the site layout and setbacks and open space and those sorts of things, but not the wetlands themselves. We'll let our colleagues in the Conservation Commission deal with that on the 27th or whenever that hearing is scheduled. Thank you. Other questions? Before we open up the public comment. I'm can you say a little bit more about the um pedestrian path with so the gravel and the boardwalk areas, et cetera? I'm guessing the conservation commission is going to be looking at that as well, since it's going straight through, you know, some of that those protected areas. But I didn't totally catch where it is on the site and particularly how it's connected for the people who are living on this um parcel parcels. So we did go through a number of conversations, um, both with planning department and conservation to try and make sure that um, whatever we were proposing would be um, approvable by both boards, both commissions, um, both in terms of just ensuring that we um, 
enhanced or, or protected that existing connection, uh, pedestrian connection, but also with respect to, you know, what we could and can't do um, in the wetland. There is, um, there are, there is a limited project status for um, pedestrian paths um, in resource areas, provided that there are a certain width and um, certain materials. And so that's what we worked with um, the conservation department on just to make sure that what we were proposing would be um, approvable under their regulation. So most of this, um, you know, a lot of this is sort of an old former roadbed and in many sorts. So it's, it's um, you know, vegetation is closing in, but there is a, a, a pretty clearly defined, you know, pedestrian path um, we're really, you know, we will do some vegetation pruning where we're necessary to make sure that that's, you know, that that pathway is is open and clear and, and you know, safe for pedestrian travel where it crosses over. Um, it does meander, you know, back and forth across some of these rear property lines. So where possible, we've taken it, um, you know, within this property itself and relocated it and reconnected it back up to its existing um, um uh, alignment um, to make sure that you know it's it's all on this property and will be maintained by you know this um, this entity, um, and then um, yeah, where where it does extend through um, some wetter portions of that BVW during the wet season, we've proposed some elevated boardwalk um, that again just is in compliance with that limited project status uh, under the wetland regulations. So all of that will be, um, yeah, we were, so the two things that is we're, we're improving it and enhancing it um, as much as possible to be able to ensure that that connection will remain. And then we are relocating it where possible to, to have all of that trail system be within this property. So they have control and, and um, responsibility over that. Uh, and so is there, uh, when we were out on a site visit, it looked like there is a sort of informal path going from sort of the front of the shed over to that portion of the lot where the pathway is are you formalizing that connection as well so people on this who are living in these homes would be able to access it right from yes that corner so so it's right like, i can't see too well here but yes off this off this bike shelter in the corner this is where the trail is now just just off the edge of the northern edge of this page um, so there is a path connection that's shown in the plans that, you know, connects up here into that, directly into that, that trail. Thank you. Yeah. That plan set was updated yesterday, the day before. So previously it was just described, but not shown on the plan. Good. Good. Um, so just in terms of process, I want to be kind of clear that um, we're still awaiting uh, stormwater report and some comments from the DPW. Right. So the plans were submitted today to DPW. So there's, they didn't have time to review them. Um, so that's for both stormwater and the other comments that were, had been made about utilities and so forth. So, um, because of the stormwater ordinance, the planning board can't close the public hearing tonight. Um, uh, and can't, close the public hearing until a stormwater permit has been issued. So um, I would recommend that, you know, you identify any other issues that might need to be addressed for the continu the inevitable continuation in order to hear the, you know, to make sure that stormwater permit gets issued. And then all of those then can be, you know, addressed um, when the stormwater permit has been issued. So in terms of public comment, we can also take public comment because um, there's quite a crowd here and also on Zoom, and we'll, we'll list out the comments that are made. Um, some of them we may address tonight, the applicant may address, others we won't. Um, but it'll be very important that we don't go through those same comments two weeks from now when we continue the hearing. So if folks are, are mindful of that. Um, we have a and I would just say it's not necessarily going to be two weeks um, because in two weeks your agenda is pretty full. So. Right. Thank you. Okay. Um, and Carolyn, help me a little bit. I've been around for a long time, but I'm forgetful. Um, why is this not a subdivision? Um, so a subdivision is the creation of a street that creates frontage. So, um, and all the street infrastructure that goes with it. So this is already, this is a private way, essentially. It's not a public street. So the frontage, frontage for this parcel is actually 
that piece that connects to North Street. So View Avenue is just Avenue in name. It's not a street. Um, and all the units are on a single parcel. So it's not subdivided into lots along a street front. Okay, thank you. And there was, I thought there was some uh, legal legal background with this street pre or with this access previously. What has changed? Um, so the legal access was actually related to um, a paper street that was never built on the north side. So right where Jeff is um, aligning. So oh. previously when the project came before the planning board and was approved, it had many more units pushed closer into the wetland, but also took advantage of a paper street, which um, where um, Jeff is um, putting his cursor. And that's what was um, determined to be not um, allowed usage for this property owner to access the property. So that's the difference is just okay. a single access. Thank you for the clarification. And now the applicant owned View Street. It's a private road, and it's like a long driveway into this one lot. Right. And uh, that's the way it always was. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's, that hasn't changed. There's shared access off of yeah. that for other houses? Right. So, you know, it would be, I don't know what the deeds references say, but um, my assumption is that there is um, something in the deed that allows, is an easement essentially for those other units to cross this property in order to get to their property okay and with the conversations you've been having about this trail system is there an associated easement with that for the public use or are we just relying on the applicants goodwill to allow to allow people to keep using that um yeah so the there you all can't require the applicant to provide public access unless they were offering it for um, you know, traffic mitigation purposes or something like that. Um, so it would be, so the idea though, is they need to provide a connection from this project to Northern, Northern Avenue, but that's really for the use of the, um, future property owners or users of the property. Um, and it's up to the applicant to determine whether that's available for the general public to use. Okay, Good. thanks. Other general or specific questions from the board before we open it up? We're good? I, well, I guess if we're asking questions, my only one is on the photometric plan. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if we could just zoom in on some of the areas by the property lines. Yeah. I didn't, I'll admit, I didn't take a great look at this. Um, right, so, I mean, there is a little bit of spillover the property line. Yeah, you do. I mean, keep in mind we do have a fence along this edge. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. but that's yeah, that's I think that's the closest. And then there's one other yeah. further north, right? These are that's all close. Yeah, right there. So a little spillover. Two right, just west of the property line. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my only other comment, because everyone knows how much I love our new lighting ordinance, um, I noticed that these light fixtures are uh, 3,000 Kelvin temperature, and I'm pretty sure that we require 2,700 Kelvin. Um, the, we can certainly, yeah, spec that as, I know it, I, I will say it has, it has been, uh, it has been a challenge. I believe you. <laughs> David and I believe you. It has been an extreme. <laughs> David and I told moment. you so, but no one listens. Yeah. We, we are bending the industry. Yeah. Well, it's it's not so much it's not so much bending the industry, right? industry as it is finding um either A products and um and lighting that even fits those categories, but then get um even getting the photometrics on them, nobody you know, uh, for liability reasons, we'll do them. Yep. So it's, okay. it's been a... Thank uh, you for raising uh, that. When you base your lighting ordinance on the astronomer's recommendation. <laughs> Duly noted. 
Duly noted. I'm sure the applicant can come back to the planning office, the building inspector, and ask for a waiver if it's impeding the completion of the development if and when the development, uh, you know, approved um, until those are much more readily available to the construction <laughs> industry. All right. Thank you, hard lighting expert. Um, we can't change an ordinance tonight. Um, so why don't we open up to public comment? And again, there's a good crowd here. Many people with uh, spent some time um, figuring out how they're going to address the board. So I would uh, suggest that you limit your comments to two minutes. Um, and I will nudge you if you're going over that. And if you are coming up after someone else, please try not to repeat their um comment or their topics we're pretty smart here on the board and we can gather most of the inferences around traffic and wetlands um and things of that nature so we didn't ha we don't have a sign up sheet um so we'll leave this up just yeah well, sure and you might need to be nearby jeffrey but yep 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 and again, the comments from the public are addressed to the planning board members, and we don't respond to each comic as it is. We take the comments, we can then cluster them into patterns, and then the board addresses them after the comment period as best as we can, along with the applicant. All right, uh, we don't have a sign-up list. Who's brave enough to go first here in council chambers? And if you just give us your name and address um, when you start, that would be great. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is David Fenton. I live at 164, 166 North Street, which is this. If I can get the cursor to move, I'm so technology savvy. This would be my house right here. So it abuts the View Avenue and this back portion. Uh, our concern here is that when, and I've got to say, Mr. Cerula has been very good uh, at communicating with us. He sat down with us on several occasions in my yard and, uh, it's been wonderful to have that that dialogue going about how this was all developing. Things have changed as a, as a result of our input, and we truly appreciate that. Initially, he had a common area for uh, the residents there, which was going to be down here. But apparently, it fell within the 200-foot uh, area of the river, which I don't know if you've all been out there. It's just a little culvert that kind of oozes um, more times than not. It's more, it's heavier down the other end. So they had to be moved. That has now been moved up to right in this area. Um, and you and I are closer than where this is going to be for my backyard. That's my concern. Um, I mean, I, you, you can dumb it down a little bit saying, you know, there's, a, there's 12 houses, there's going to be 12 cars. Well, everyone has two cars. So there's going to be a lot more traffic. And to have a common area, I guess, it's a policy or or a zoning thing that this has to be in place. And I, I question that because in some instances that may be applicable, that may be needed, but in this location in Ward 3, downtown Northampton, basically, you are with that ramp, you're 30 seconds from the from the bike path, uh, but by bike you're right now either a minute or a minute and a half by bike to Bates Street or the Woodmont Road connection. Um, and as far as open space, you have Lampern Park, which is about a five-minute walk, and you have the very spacious Sheldon Field, which is five minutes from there. So my question is, why does it need to be there? Again, the property is going to be from here to you away. Um, do we need 12 houses congregating there, having a party there, um, having a fire pit there, that close to our backyard? It's right there. Um, if you came out, you would know that. Uh, you would you would could see that personally. It, it is very, very close. Um, so I would like to see if that could be moved somewhere or maybe uh, 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 permission to not have something like that in this particular case. Um, and this is the first time we've heard about the sidewalk. We knew there was going to be a berm or a, or a curb along View Avenue. Uh, this is the first we've heard of a sidewalk. We're just, um, but we'll talk to Mr. Sewell about that. But we, we do appreciate your time. And um, and I guess the other thing was the culverts, the drainage ditches. I, I kind of forget where those are going to be. I, I kind of thought they were up maybe one here and another one down here somewhere. But again, that's something Will. we can address with him. Great. Thank you very much for your time. I truly appreciate yep. it. Thank you.
staying here at council chambers for public comment. Please. Hi, good evening. My name's Jane Myers. I live in Florence, and I've been learning about this proposed project through the files in the city and from residents who are friends of mine on North Street. It's clear to me that the significant trees, I know that you said that you don't deal with wetlands, but it directly affects the site plan that you heard about in great detail. So I want to just talk a bit about it and let the cons come to make the decision too. It's clear to me that the significant trees and wetlands mean a lot to the people who live in this neighborhood. They appreciate the flood control, heat mitigation that the woods and wetlands provide. The neighborhood also understands how excessively high the water table is at 8 View Avenue. Upon reading the plans and documents, it's amazing to me that the city would allow 29 out of 35 Norway spruce trees to be cut down. That's the number, 29. That's 82% of the trees. And uh, uh, differently from what was said by the presenter before, the USDA says their lifespan is more likely 200 years plus, some in optimal circumstances up to 300 years. The city would also be allowing within... Um, 35 feet of the bordering vegetated wetlands near Milliard Brook. These woods and wetlands purify the city's air and groundwater. They provide shade that's 15 degrees cooler than the temperatures downtown Northampton. And each of the 35 significant trees, which range in diameter from 20 to 47 inches, absorb up to 150 gallons of water per tree per day. So without those trees, that water is going to be even a greater issue. The developers proposing to add 83% more impervious space to, uh, area surface area to the site. Without the trees and wetlands to mitigate heavy rainstorms and severe stormwater runoff, the homes to be constructed with slab on grade foundations will be vulnerable to flood risk. Tropical Storm Floyd covered the highest points of the parcel in 1999, upland of where the homes are to be built. Because the homes are built so low to the ground, they are more susceptible to flooding than homes with regular foundations and full basements. I believe these woods and wetlands should be purchased and permanently protected by the city of Northampton. The residents of this neighborhood deserve protection from climate change, just like any other neighborhood in the city. And I just have two questions you can consider. Could you please confirm what the current open space is on the plans? And would you clarify how far above grade the first floors of the homes are? Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Ms. Myers. Uh, anyone else? Uh, so there are sovereign builders on the applicant. So just wanted to say that we looked at a number of different options for this property and most of which had higher density and likely, you know, were definitely greater profitability. So I think it's oftentimes misconstrued that if developers driven solely by profit, these are standalone units that are of modern design. And so minimalist or modern is much more expensive. So anytime you're building an individual unit and not grouping units in a single building, it's more expensive. So we really carefully looked at and wanted to do something different and something forward thinking, something interesting for, for, for the city and in the process trying to preserve the land and and be mindful of of the you know natural characteristics of the area. Obviously, it's it's desirable in that it it hopes to minimize vehicle traffic and to you know promote people going to work or shopping, walking or bicycle using a bicycle bike trail is right there. So it's it's important I think to note that it's really not driven by profit. This this is this is these are. Uh, highly energy efficient, very different design, modern design. And it's and so there's many, many ways to have done this uh, for more profit. So I really was interested in doing something interesting and different. And hopefully it'll have some, it'll be in demand, but that's yet to be seen because it's so small. Um, you know, how many people want to own and live in an 800 square foot house? I guess that's yet to be seen. The infrastructure cost is very high here to, to work on the site. So the driver is really 
to do something that works well for the city that 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 creates housing but also is attractive and appealing and works with the the habitat the nature thank you Great. thank you mr Schlimmer. Sovereign's project. Uh, name and address, uh, please. Beach Bridges, 12 Northern Avenue, almost and a butter. Um, Sovereign's project represents precisely what urban areas need to not be doing. We need to protect woods in this age of climate. 2023, this past year, has been determined to be the hottest year ever. We can expect this to continue. That woods cools our neighborhood. It is I who brought my thermometer downtown, measured 100 degrees under the Silverscape Designs um, thing, and then took it to the woods. It was 85 degrees. This is so incredibly valuable to the city of Northampton. I charge you, planning board members, Carolyn, all of you, to save this woods and to prevent all of this impervious surface, the cutting of trees, and then the paving. It's extraordinary. And we need to keep that cooling. The, we need that buffer between King Street and North Street. We need you to be responsible members of the community and say no to this project. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak? If not, we'll move over to the folks on Zoom. Yeah, again, to process if the meeting is, the meeting will be continued tonight and there will be, we will not close the public comment period, I don't think. So there will be another opportunity for the public to come forward and speak. We'll just try to kind of hone in on those comments. Yep, please come up and ask your question. It doesn't have to be a comment. You don't have then, um, Yep. My name is Rosalind Torrey, and I live on Northern Avenue. And I was just curious if this project continue. I don't know if it includes the parcel on Northern or if it's just view as its own. I know that there's another lot that's on northern just wanted to know how they relate to each other if if i understand the applicant's presentation there's one lot that's going to be peeled off and um listed as an a and r lot um and that's probably the one that you're um detailing is that correct yeah yes in fact that's the a and r on the agenda for um later is that parcel on northern and just explain what a and r means so um, anyone who owns property along an existing street that um, has frontage that meets the minimum frontage requirement in the zoning district um, and the lot size can come before the planning board to essentially carve out a, a separate building lot and it comes to the planning board and the planning board looks at it and determines that there's no additional frontage that's required to be built in order to create that parcel. So that's why it's called, um, it's subdivision approval not required in order to create a separate building lot along frontage. So um, that is the process um, by which the applicant is um, going to create that separate building lot at the end of Northern. The back of it, it's not connected to this pro project, but it is, it abuts the project. And the path, the pedestrian path goes around that parcel. Yeah. Thank you. Any other comments? Just one question, please. Well, come on. Last one from you for the time being. Um, people are, are 
sending in questions to you via computer? Correct. Is that accessible to us since it's a public hearing? Well, we'll how do we we'll get read, access? We'll read them out loud. Oh, okay. When they come in. Okay. It's in more. Great. Thank you. Great. Okie doke. So at this point, we'll move over to uh, the participants on Zoom. Um, Carolyn, actually, I don't see any at this point, but it may be something about my. Yeah. Um, so, Robert. Um, okay. Eileen Messer, um, how do these designs conform to the existing architecture? Mary, I live at 184, 186 North Street, and there are certain times of the year with heavy rainfall, my cellar floods. Since these homes will be built on slabs, I imagine they will flood. Even if they don't, they will likely develop health-destroying mold, and the builders will have walked away. Um, just hold on, Carolyn. The first one was about how do these new proposed buildings um, align with the existing architecture of the neighborhood? Is that the way you I think that it? was the intention, but it just said, how do these designs conform to existing architecture? Yes. Yeah. So I assume second that's one. with the neighborhood. Yep. Second one's about high water table. Mm -hmm. Yep. And um, those are the ones that have yet to be addressed. So there are only two comments offered from yes. the public? Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's one hand raised from uh, uh, Jacqueline's iPhone. Um, I believe this is the um, resident who we're going to offer time to speak verbally because of an accommodation. Um, so do we need to unmute Jacqueline? Did, did we have a letter from this person? Was that a different? Yes. No, yeah. I believe there is a letter from this person also in the public file. There's a number of letters from the butters in the public file that the board um, has looked at prior to the meeting. So it, it, that's a very good question. We can't not have her speak because she offered no, that, a letter. That's but, fine. Yeah. I just wanted to make it clear that um, we have read the letters yep. that you've submitted. So those are also acknowledged. Great. Great. Um, and then, so the request was for um, a reasonable accommodation. Um, and so the response was, um, you know, even though the reasonable accommodation is met through chat, um, um, George um, had um, asked me to send a message back to Jackie that 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 was, would be accommodated for one minute of um, oral comment on Zoom, even though it's above and beyond what a reasonable accommodation would be. So um, I will need to, let me just unmute. Okay. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay, great. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. My name is Jacqueline McCraner. I live at 124 North Street. Um, as I'm hearing, not all of the residents in the North Street neighborhood support the proposed project at 8 View Avenue. I am a 300 foot abutter and I do not support it. Our water tables are excessively high due to the presence of underground streams and springs, the Milliard Brook that flows here from the Connecticut River, and because we're at the foot of the steep side of the Round Hill Road Glacial Drumlin, which has its own underground springs and streams. I do not believe permitting the proposed project is a responsible action by the city. Building in the wetlands would strip our neighborhood of critical flood control, as well as heat mitigation from the significant trees. Cutting down the significant trees would strip the city of its heat mitigation of the downtown Northampton heat island. Slab on grade foundations built in wetlands are prone to flooding, mold, mildew, cracking due to soil settlement, heat loss, and costly maintenance and repairs. It may cost less to build up front, but maintenance issues can be an expensive nightmare down the road for homeowners. Destroying the woods and wetlands behind 8 View Avenue to build 12 homes, which folks aren't even sure here, it sounds like, if people are gonna wanna live in such small homes. So to gamble with that 
with slab on grade foundations is not the answer to the housing crisis. This project, in my view, is morally reprehensible. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Good, good point. And we heard you loud and clear. It came through very well. And we appreciate the letter that you sent to us prior to this. Um, are there any other comments from? Okay. So we'll turn it back to the board for questions at this point. We'll keep the public comment period open, but we'll turn it over to the board. And again, we're trying to raise <laughs> raise issues for the applicant so that um, they can go away and address those if, if, if there's some serious ones that we're unclear about. Um, I would. Uh, uh, and this really doesn't need to be resolved now because we're going to be coming back. Um, uh, it would be great to to look at this the plan and figure out um, where else you might be able to put the um, uh, that social hall or the social. It's not base. It's not a hall. Okay. The social rock pit. Okay, the the <laughs> gathering place around yeah, the got it. Okay, great, thank you. Um, even I I think in the past um I I, I respect Chris's comment about that we're not the uh, uh, conservation commission, but in the past when we've looked at projects like this of many houses backed up to a conservation area, wetlands area, the planning board has talked about some way of trying to limit, and this may happen at the Conservation Commission, but limit the uh, the human tendency to kind of improve your backyard space, create lawns, um, play areas for your children, badminton, that's whatever. So um, I just want to go on record and hoping that the Conservation Commission looks at that also, some way of creating a, some kind of bound so that five years from now, new homeowners aren't increasing their lawn into that area if this is approved uh, yeah i'll just say that they regularly um uh create conditions that sort of create those hard barriers um uh, for that purpose Good. thanks <laughs> no, physically in the ground <laughs> Good. stone bounds bollards <laughs> is there a fence at there's at that front I guess you can call it the front, it's called the side setback in the plan. But at that area of the common space, is there, there's no lot line fence there? Uh, no, I think it's just vegetation right now. Okay. So the, the existing old... vegetation is what's in the drawing. That's what's there. The vegetation the proposed as part of the plan, right? Is, is new planting. In the back of all of the parking areas, step up to the mic. Yeah. Please, so our friends in our hybrid yeah. setting can right. hear you. Thank you. So you're referring to this area here? Is that what you're speaking to? Yes. That, yeah, so um, there, I mean, there's some additional, there's some plantings there now. We're proposing some additional plantings on on this part of the, on, on this site to help buffer that. In terms of fencing, the only fence is uh, uh, behind that one parking area mm -hmm. in the southern end. Right. The other parking areas, the headlights, you assume, will be blocked by. Yeah, I mean, this this northern in the area is quite a distance, and there's quite a bit of vegetation. This one, uh, similarly, is um, you know, there's there's a, a pretty dense cluster of trees here, not a, not all of which are coming down. Um, so that's yeah, there's there isn't much, you know, headlight intrusion in, in other portions of the of the site. So you might want to work with the property owner to see if like a high fence there might be a solution. Along this edge. Yeah. Yep. Um, I mean, we could tell you to put it down in that nook that's in the 200 riverfront zone, but the conservation commission might not right. like that. So. No, we intentionally took it out of there just to avoid riverfront area impact. So yeah, we really were trying to avoid any, any jurisdictional um, resource area impacts for the project. So where's the a &R that we're going to be looking at? Um, that's this one here. Oh. Yeah. Um, so after a number of meetings with the, the, the abutters and talking about the fire pit area, 
we feel like there is a better location that that is uh, that we might move one of the bike storage areas, but it, it was pretty unanimous that the, the director butters wanted to see it moved from the location that David is concerned about. And so um, we're open to that, to finding a, an alternative to that and, and feel like it's, it's a good idea and it's very possible. I own a property on Northern and, I, and we talked about, and it's larger than necessary for zoning. We talked about carving out, re reconfiguring that lot so that it might move there as well. But I think there are some alternatives that would uh, be more agreeable to the right. waters and, and good alternatives. And that common area could be within the setback. There's nothing built in there. It's just a right. gravel right. area. Or maybe shifting it so it's the, the butter's garage is between the common space and the house. I mean, it, it is. That's a garage that we're seeing, right? Right. It, it is. Right. Um, but as David said, if you if you if you view this site, it it seems pretty close. Uh, although there is a buffer of his garage and, and his house, and with some plantings, I think it might be less uh, disturbing than it is on the plan. But I think we should look at and you know consider some other options as well. And we you know we spent quite quite a bit of time meeting with the neighbors and and really want to work with them and and make sure everybody um has input and that we listen and try to try to work with it as much as possible but we're so, big we're big fans of covered bike areas though so don't lose them i'm right. not okay. saying eliminate all right. I, that's all i think david would be okay with a yep. covered bike area as long as it's not an area to congregate very good so that might be something we see on a revised plan at the next hearing, the next meeting. Potentially. Yeah. Okay. Other? No, no, maybe at this. Oh, well, we, there's a question about the sidewalk, right? Mm. Sidewalk material. Yes, so that requirement, uh, it needs to be cement concrete, not bituminous. Yeah. And so how how far into the site does that need to be? I mean, this whole thing, this isn't a street. I mean, this is part of the the parcel. So I just, I don't quite understand. I mean, we don't require people to have concrete walks in their, to their house, right? I would suggest that it go to that crosswalk. I mean, or it could stop. I mean, basically, the the zoning says um, essentially the the pieces of the project that act and function like a street. You need to build the infrastructure and the sidewalk connectivity in compliance with our street standard. So that view avenue, even though it's not a street, it's acting like that for this pros project. So you know, pulling it into where the T is um, for the rest, I think that would be appropriate if it makes sense to go up and around to the crosswalk, that might make sense. And then the rest of it could be bituminous. So that, that will essentially narrow New Avenue? It will a little bit. Is, is, uh, is View Avenue paved to the edges of the... It is. Okay. To the edges of the city's easement to the property line to the right of way. Okay. It, it's not a right of way, but it's, it's a property, property line. Right? It's a property line. By the city. Yeah. Okay. I mean, the site plan shows that it looks like there's some a couple feet, not quite five feet, but right. I mean, it looks like there's saying, some space. But, yeah. It's grass pretty much goes up. <laughs> Good. Um, the concerns about high water table um, and the, the culverts and stormwater retention. Um, will be addressed more or less and be evaluated by the city engineers. Right. They've, they have evaluated that. You'll see comments about it, but the infiltration system, for example, the standard is it has to be two feet above high groundwater. I mean, the reason why they're building on slab is because the groundwater is high. It varies from a foot and a half to three feet something um, above um, seasonal, seasonal high groundwater. So, um, the point is that you know they're not putting the foundations in seasonal high groundwater. So Look or the that grading plan, it seems like you're building it up quite a bit above existing grade. It's in the back portion of the site, yes. In there in the western portion, yes. 
yeah so, so that's it's like it's essentially taking the six feet or something the four yeah it varies yep um Carolyn, we heard you know certainly quite a few comments about the loss of trees in relationship to the establishment of new housing um you provided us with a uh or you or the applicant provided us with some charts some kind of evaluation of i think I trees guess. in terms of the carbon yeah. loss um could you talk about that a little bit for us sure so we over the last um six months or so um with our office contracted with um uh, consultants to do um, set sort of create a tool for us to look at carbon impacts of different um, um, various um, projects and outcomes and locations. So this calculator essentially looks, you can put the input in and sort of what the existing conditions are, um, where the project is located and what the um, typical vehicle miles traveled are for each geographic area of the city. So that has a carbon impact. So basically looking at transportation impacts, building impacts, trees, existing buildings versus proposed. And so um, we ran and numbers of this project in this location versus this number of units in a similar project further out in a different location. And the impacts were much higher building in sort of new pristine area out, let's say, Ryan Road or Florence Road or something like that. Um, so again, we know that there's a huge demand for housing um, and that you know, we are, that's part of the issue and related to this um, um, climate change that affects people who are at the lower end of our economic spectrum more than others. And so, um, you know, about looking at that evaluation, both in the short term and also the long term, I think is important. Um, the zoning ordinance does not say not to remove trees, but in fact, we go beyond most other cities in the Commonwealth and require replacement based on a calculation for the for that tree removal. And of course, it's not all the trees on the site. It's in and there are no trees, you know, between the, at the 35 foot buffer, um, of course, from that. So, um, um, so that was sort of the quick look at that. Um, and so, um, you know, we think that certainly from the sustainable Northampton plan, the, um, the building, the building, um, standards for these new buildings are highly efficient in addressing, um, units that are, you know, accessible, more accessible to people um, because of their size, simply because of their size. And of course, the access to the bike path and the network in the street in the in this neighborhood. Thank you. And that, that was one other comment we heard was the open space calculation. I mean, I would have to think we're like over 90 percent or something. Open space. Yeah, it's we're less than 10 percent, I think, or, you know, 12 percent with with impervious area on the overall all property. So like 88% open space. open space, right? Right. Yep. Yep. And the other comment we heard was, does this style of housing fit in with the existing architecture? Well, it does not mirror the existing architectural, which is, you know, early 1900, most of it, uh, single family homes. Um, but it's certainly something different, something innovative in this person's perspective. So, um, whether or not it fits into the the, the uh, architecture of that neighborhood around North Street and the cemetery, um, I don't think that really comes into our consideration um, at this point. It is a kind of set apart also in many ways, but I appreciate the, uh, the developer trying to do something different and trying to do something smaller and uh, uh, perhaps taking a gamble, perhaps not. We'll see if this project is approved. Um, and just sort of on that note, you know, this neighborhood is, uh, as you know, along with many other neighborhoods, has sort of an eclectic mix of architectural styles, and the zoning does not pick or dictate architectural styles. It's really more about scale, um, more than architectural style. 
There were, there's one other comment that came in if you're done, sure. once you're done talking on, I just didn't want to forget on chat. Great. Go ahead. Okay. Um, David from 125 North Street um, it just made a comment. Several new developments in downtown Northampton have homes that have been on the market for several years that have yet to sell. For example, Bridge Street, Pomeroy Terrace, the condos on Holly Street. Meanwhile, we have a lack of affordable housing and a climate crisis on our hands. What will be the plan if these homes do not sell? The, the drop the price. Drop the price, go to the bank. Um, but thank you, David. I think that does raise, I think in the application, the application speaks to uh, 1.8% or, or, or some of the units being in an affordable range. Is that true? I think it was. Um, I don't recall that specifically, but certainly with the smaller scale units, the, you know, the, the target market is for something, you know, lower than, you know, what an average, you know, 1,800,000 square foot single family home would go for that. This is, you know, we're offering something unique in the market that, um, you know, hopefully there's there's a demand for. It seems okay. like there's certainly some appeal in other towns. So for sure. I'll, I'll look again, though. I thought sure. in the application there was something, a percentage of the 12 units would be uh, affordable and it came out to 1.8%. And there's a there's a requirement in the zoning that um, a percentage of the units either be affordable or be less than 12, 1,200 square feet. So I think the number is nine of those units are under 1,200 square feet, and three of them are the three larger ones that were discussed. So I think that was, and that's, the zoning requires that, but it's either or. It's And so given that these are, you know, yeah. around 900 square feet, by their very nature are going to be more accessible to people at the at a lower price point. Thanks. All right. Should we make a motion to continue the hearing at this point? Or can I give the audience one last bite at the apple? Everybody okay till we come back again? I I pre the calendar. Okay, we have one last comment here. I appreciate the concern about housing. Let's talk about Airbnb. Most of many, many houses along North Street throughout this neighborhood we have been talking about are now Airbnb. People have come from outside, bought houses, built their own house out back, and then rented out the front house in Airbnb. Other people, many, many people throughout North Street area are doing Airbnb. If we want housing, let's have the conversation about Airbnb and empty dwellings. There are houses that have been empty for years. We need to deal with this and we need to, these are places where people used to live. One of these houses that's been empty for the last few years, these people own it and they come Every time they come to town, like once a year or something, they stay there, this wealthy couple. And I, I said to the next door neighbor, don't you wonder how many people lived there 50 years ago? She said, I happen to know. I lived here. There were 11 people, and she named them, you know, this extended family. So we went from 11 people living in this house down to zero. Page Bridges, Northern Avenue. That's right. Okay. Please come on up to the podium. Uh, well, I did want to say, my name is Dennis Helmers, 174. You got, you got to be at the mic there. Come on up, Dennis. Watch out for that cord. Uh, Dennis Helmers, 174, 176 North Street. I just want to make sure since the hearing is still being continued, this I want to think more about what I want to say and how I want to say it. So I just want to make sure that A, I can email you my comments and B, when you next meet, not in two weeks, evidently, um, correct. I can still speak at that time. Correct. That's correct. Correct. Okay. Everyone will be able to speak again. Okay. And it'll be posted in a in a legal way today is not now speak your peace uh, forever hold your peace. <laughs> no. speak now or forever hold your peace no
Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it won't. Will it be posted? I think in yeah. agenda. Right. It'll be, yeah. on a... it'll be on the agenda, but they don't resend postcards, but right. it'll you won't get a new sent. notification. Right. This hearing is your notification. No, of but there's a legal hearing. notice posted at City Hall, wherever Carolyn right. does. The agenda, oh, 48 yeah. hours. Ahead. The agenda. Yeah. But no, there won't be postcards to butter. So. And we will set the date and time of the right continuation now. Right, right now. now. Yeah. So. so you can write it down and send it okay. to yourself. So this is going to be based on the doodle poll, right? Mm -hmm. That you all answered. Um, During the summer, the planning board often goes down to one meeting a damn, month. Damn, you did not than, answer. I mean, what are the dates again? Rather than two meetings a month. And they will be emailed. So um, <laughs> the most people could attend was July 25th and August 22nd. And then, so um, those are the fourth Thursdays of the month. So the next meeting would be July 25th. Sam, can you make that one? Because our next meeting, June 27th, is right. our full agenda. Right. So then our next one is going to be once, just once in July. Okay. I move to continue the hearing at 8 View Avenue to sometime that Carolyn will tell us on July 25th. <laughs> I mean, you could do seven o'clock because we don't have anything yet set for Great. the agenda. Seven o'clock on July 25th. I second. Great, any discussion? All right, all in favor of moving it to July 25th, 25th. at seven o'clock. All right, unanimous. Thank you folks for coming. We have a few more things we're gonna Okay, minutes. Talk about the A and R. If anybody wants to stay, get popcorn, George. Carolyn, are we confirmed for that other August? August twenty second. Twenty second. Yeah, the most people be. could come to that. So I put I can't come. Right. Um. Let me just see. You changed so many times. I did. I think you just changed once. Twenty second. Wait a second. Why are you not showing up? I did respond. It took me a right row. I hope people can come the twenty fifth. Um, David, you can't. I can't. I don't see you. I don't see you on here. You're still here. Yeah, that's good. Well, that was fun. Oh, it's not over yet. It's not over yet. I think that's for now. We're getting to the real meat of you it now. You said maybe. Yeah, that's definitely. That was just the filler. Isn't that weird? We get to the real stuff. Oh. That's Did you fill in? ARs. This is where the bread is buttered. That sounds weird. I'm not even on there. I know. Wait, if you put your mouse in there and then try to scroll, it's it. Oh, like. It's where the rubber hits the road. Not anymore. Do you remember what you said? Um, well, I'm out of town on the 22nd, so I know okay. I can't do it, but I can do the 25th. Okay. So so we'll still have seven, six or seven for the 22nd. Second. Oh, you're talking about oh right. She can't do that. So that's... She can't do this one. She... Right, 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 right. Oh, right. This is the 25th anyway. Thank you. Fine for everyone here, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Okay. I'm going to say forget about it. <laughs> solid <laughs> um okay so the only other thing is the um oh boy um the a and r let's see if i can pull this up oh. yes write it on a postcard and mail it to yourself it's completely separate you see my calendar yeah you can send yourself emails this is Send yourself an email and schedule with them. I do it all the time. Like, send myself an email in a month. Like, wake up. So it's cool. You just have to stack those. Like, every day you send it for a month later so you can stack them up. My grandfather, oh. my wonderful grandfather, when he was quite aged, had we had a shared Google calendar for him. And once a week, he had a 
agenda item on it that said change pants. <laughs> Like two a week. Once a week. Yeah. That, yeah, I still have it actually. Yeah, it was who was gonna take him to church this week and everything. Yep. Is that that's so that's why your calendar is so full? Pants in there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm sorry, I'm just um it's not in the new system. That is sad. It's it's on the calendar. They must calendar. not have applied to the system. Damn. Okay. So um, I can pull up the survey. I mean, obviously you saw it. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have to pull up the... Right. So um, it's really just... Um, it's... Op um, over a hundred feet of frontage on northern. Um, I mean, sorry. Um, in order to create fifty feet of frontage, they were required to extend and build a section of northern. So they've completed that. Found it. Oh my gosh. Okay, you want to screen share? <laughs> no, just kidding. So wait, what is it? Um, that's so weird. Twenty-four four. Chris Kearney. Yeah. A twenty-four twenty-four. What? That's Look at the search. Why are you in there? Just search A and R. You're in a whole different system than I'm in. Where's the regular one with this? The one you have all this stuff. <laughs> Because I'm not in the public portal. Yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Well, you guys saw it. I... Just hold, David, just hold that up in front of the camera <laughs> so we can see it. I'm just going to pull up the survey. Take a picture of it and then email it. <laughs> okay. No. You guys wanted to spend a lot of time here, didn't you? Um, yeah. If you're on Zoom, we're just uh, pausing a little bit to find a uh, location for our A and R discussion. I just did search up here. Oh, right. Records. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. It's twenty-four four. Oh my god. That's okay. So I'll pull up the details, files. It's in the box an hour for FD support. Really? That's how you are now? Six copies of the say in our map that would lay out all across our desk. And now look. Hold it like a map. And yeah, look over here. It's just, it just allows us to cut down more trees. <laughs> is it coming? Voila. Ooh. So um, there it is, lot one. Um, so there's this extension. So this is 50 feet of an, ex of, um, it wasn't quite 50 feet of extension, but um, see there, the seam there. So this meets the 50 foot frontage, but the lot is much bigger. Was so that extension done to allow this to be set? Yeah to be anard mm -hmm. because it wasn't improved frontage so even though the layout the right of it was there it was there right yeah yeah and and the city extended the road the applicant, the applicant. Mm -hmm. and do they also have to like extend the services like the sewer and water yeah so that was extended yeah it was mm -hmm. wow and this is uh Bike path, uh, uh, a walking path to the rail trail. Right. So at some point, you know, that's on our radar to make it accessible. Um, but, um, and, and in fact, 50, 12 years ago, when the, when the previous owner um, brought the application forward, um, the plan was to build um, a bridge connector across the, um, do you remember that? And, um, 
at the time, DCR didn't want to allow that. And so um, the applicant couldn't do it. But DCR has changed in time, so that's good. Uh -huh. So we'll um, pursue making that um, a safe, accessible connection at some point in the future. How far did they go? What's on this one? The gray? That's how far they built this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So see the um, seam, the um, where it says bituminous seam right here. Oh, that. So that was the extent. Yeah. Built yeah. Okay. So um, this is not does not require a subdivision. So we just need an, uh, a motion to. I move to endorse this ANR. I second. Motion's been made and seconded to endorse the ANR on Northern Avenue. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, very good. We have uh, minutes from May 23rd that Carolyn forwarded to us. Did I? Yeah. I did? Yeah, you did. You're I, so I busy. I saw some document where we talked about the meeting process for the new hybrid. Oh, right, right, right. Is that okay. in the minutes? No. Okay. No, that's it. Well, there was there was some in the minutes, but then also in the staff memo. Oh, maybe that's where I saw it. Yeah, yep. I I did not receive minutes. You didn't. I don't think I did. I I was behind the eight ball on that. Okay, all right. It says minutes. Correct. Right. The agenda says minutes May twenty third, but you right. didn't send them. I didn't send. Okay. Them. Well, uh, so I'd like to. I like the process that I read. I'm not sure where I read it in the staff. In the staff memo. memo. Is there anything else we need to do to? formalize that or is and when does that go into effect i guess is my question um so let me just pull that up so be yeah it'd be good for us just to kind of run through it again unless you can can you speak verbally to well, there's like eight steps or something I mean, yeah. does the chair retain the prerogative to override the process and allow one minute here and there to people i mean to i mean so other it sounds quite authoritarian, doesn't it? Sure, it does. I, I think it should, it's authoritarian it to a really nice guy. <laughs> Can we get a big timer clock? Yep. Well, the city council has a um, Zoom timer. I mean, they use it's not theirs; like it's a digital. Thing that they a, use on the screen yeah. on the mm -hmm. Zoom screen. Yeah. Um. So music. I could wrap it up. So based on the discussions last time, it's it louder and louder. Um. You know. You, there was discussion about sort of rem, um, helping members of the public understand what the public hearing process is and um, that, um, you know, taking comment is about listening to issues and that it's not, and David, you've mentioned this before, it's not about, it's not a vote about how many people, you know, like or dislike a project, but you're looking at the issues. Um, and reminding folks that there's no need to repeat comments again in that same vein um and that written or spoken comments have the same weight um and um so the idea would be to advertise that the meeting is an in-person meeting with a zoom option but clarifying that if there's some technical difficulty that the meeting will carry on and that um, even if Zoom can't be used for whatever reason, that um, the meeting still happens and that there has to be a quorum of uh, board members in person, but board members who can't participate in person could participate remotely so long as there's still a quorum in person. Um, and- That thing you said about having Zoom, but if it, Zoom fails, we still go on, is that- in keeping with open meeting law guidelines from COVID and everything or whatever, like that won't raise an open meeting law violation. So as long as it's advertised, um, and I will confirm with the city solicitor, but as long as it's advertised as in person, because you could go completely in person with no Zoom. Right. You don't have to have a Zoom. So as long as it's clear that the meeting, the official meeting is in person and there'll be a Zoom option um, for people but if they're concerned about getting their comments in, they need to email them in or mail them in. Um, is this is this a like something we should write on the mm -hmm. posted agenda too? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it's kind of like before the Zoom, like people they were on NCTV, YouTube streaming, or whatever, right? right? Like right. school committee or whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're just saying that if a if a planning board member cannot make it 
but wants to participate in the meeting, they can via Zoom and they can contribute to the discussion. They can also vote on motions, right? Yeah, vote on motions, but again, the quorum would be in person. So if Zoom goes down, you still have a quorum, like you don't exactly. lose a member because exactly. technical difficulties, then you lose the quorum. Right. We talked about, uh, right, and even the presenters need to be here in person. That's why we exnade this Sorry, today. Charles. Yeah. And the no, uh, and we wouldn't have people out in Zoom as a, as a comment or do any presentation, share screen, and right. kind of do it that way. So do we have the ability to mute and unmute people? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good. Um, and then you talked about taking the, like you did, like you've been doing all along is in-person comments first and then um zoom comments or chat um is it, and is it comments or chat or are we doing well or all yeah on zoom is what you, you, you all are going to go to that okay yes yeah, that's that's the big change mm -hmm. we're going oral um Will we still need to look at the chat if people provide comments by chat and oral? Well, it depends on what you want to do. Do you want to just I, do one and not the other? I think we should just do one okay. and not the other. So no chat. I think that'd get a little confusing okay. for us to kind of want just to disable chat. the chat. Yeah, we can yeah. disable it, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Or can we put a note in there? Because some people want this the chat to be like, I can't if there's a technical issue. But like it's not just like a caveat that no comments in the chat are not comments there just i think that when chat is disabled you can still send messages to the post, post maybe it's not everyone think. Can see it. so if there were a technical issue like that then somebody theoretically yeah. i think should still be able to message i thought carol when you held up something to your camera <laughs> Help. um carolyn then we talked a little bit about a time limit so today we asked people to speak no more than two minutes that seemed to work pretty well we didn't have to send it so we went back and forth about whether the zoom participants should also have two minutes or just one minute one minute seems kind of short to me and we're really setting us setting them up as us versus them kind of you know zoom. it's too short people don't get to the yeah in one minute i feel like we'll just end up in a bunch of back and forth your minute negotiation yeah yeah they're just yeah so two or three seems fine I, I would prefer, unless it becomes a real issue, that the room is too full of people to allow everyone kind of whatever we decide for the public here in person, we should pretty much do for the Zoom. Maybe there should be a pool of minutes that gets divided by the number of people that would speak. Yes. So if there's three people. Like, I'm good with speaking for 25 minutes. minutes. <laughs> public. <laughs> well, there's some people who could do that for sure. You get 1.8% of the minutes. That's right. Um, okay. I think that was all of it. So, George, you're saying not to not to put an, a permanent restriction on Zoom comments that it will be meeting by meeting. And so, like today, if you since you put a restriction on in person, then it would be the same for Zoom. But if right. you hadn't put a restriction on in person, then there yeah. also wouldn't be a restriction. I on think Zoom. so. And I think the chair will pretty much say, "Okay, we're opening up public comment." Um, we ask you to speak no more than two or three minutes, two if there's a lot of people, three if there's hardly anybody, but give them some kind of guideline. Mm -hmm. We don't want somebody up there for seven, eight, ten minutes. The open meeting law doesn't say you have to have a rule. Yeah. It's right. just the chair has to be reasonable right. to whatever's happening. Yeah, And, and we want to give the people on Zoom, afford them the same time limit as the in-person people. Okay. I feel like you should get some sort of benefit. I listen harder if you're in person, personally. I, I've always been, I mean, I do, we're going to open it up. I just, our society needs to get back to being, you know, with other human beings. Um, the only other thing we talked about is we would check in on this after six months and see if it's working okay. Could you send that email to me <laughs> or put it on your calendar? Yeah. I'll do it right now. Schedule. Um, is it, Cheryl, what I don't understand, I know you're busily codified, is why we have every committee and commission has a different set of protocols. Why hasn't the city kind of said, we're going to standardize this a little bit? Because the zoning board 
they don't meet in person at all. The uh, the CPA CPC they don't meet in person. It's it's it's. I mean, and some of them have gone back and forth. And yeah, but I guess that would be a city council or a mayoral thing. It just seems to be confusing for the residents. There's so many committees that are somewhat ca casual compared to like city council. Like yeah. I think it would be a huge burden for. I don't know, you know all the committees more than I do, but like for them to follow what city council, does, like for there to be one rule for all of them would be right. a burden. I and think. also city council is so different than yeah. most no. of the other ones. No, and, and I think they're an outlier, really. Yeah. City council is an outlier, but all these other boards, historical commission, the planning board, the CPC, I'm surprised that we're not all doing, all doing hybrid in some format or all doing in person or all doing just online. It's confusing, yeah. but- that's just my my editorial comment. This is somewhat related to today's like this delay that we're having. We we knew we were gonna that this was not gonna happen. That we weren't gonna vote today on this this meeting. Is there a way, like, given the fact that we knew that that was gonna happen, and we're not gonna send out more postcards? Like of all, like I, I think that there's, there's something a little confused about about that. Like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm not. If they, I mean, my postcard just got <laughs> thrown in the junk, but like, but like the the point is like I, I think that, uh, and I'm not even a butter. I don't think, but technically, um, but. The... Check that. <laughs> but... Yeah, but your house is more than yeah, it's like more than eight hundred feet yeah, away. More than three hundred feet. Yeah. So, um, Sam, are you saying we shouldn't have held tonight's well, meeting? I'm just wondering if we need to have, if we're going to do something where we know we are going to have a, we're not going to vote on it. If in that situation we need to send out another postcard, it's different when, when it's like, oh, actually, we need to wait a minute. We it's just 12 o'clock. We haven't made a choice. Life happens. We need to now move to the next meeting. But in this situation, we knew from the get-go that we were not going to vote. Like, this was the equivalent of, like, uh, what is the meeting that happens, like, on Tuesday? This is, like, the, the tech. This was, like, a tech review. Well, I, I mean, I would argue that this... Um, we didn't know uh, at the beginning of the week, I wasn't sure if the plans were going to come in on time Okay. and DPW would certainly do the best they could. Yeah. The plans didn't come in, but there's also with a project of this size, I think people want to talk about what their concerns are. And so I, I think it, it's not necessarily going to be the same answer for e each project, but, um, I think it makes sense to go ahead and voice those concerns and get them out so that we, in that continuation, the applicant can work on modifications, like where that oh, fire pit that, is going to be that or whatever. That's in the world. I'm not, I'm not arguing about that. But, but we don't, we're not required legally to send out a new postcard and that money that co it costs to send out the postcard, we could just send to the schools instead. Because sometimes they <laughs> for, for the, they can pay for it. What's that? Well, I mean, yeah. that's not I mean, I like me. not using the system to like try to trick people to not come. Like, no, no, I right? know that. So, like, and I think most people, we, we send the postcards out because open meeting law says we have to send postcards. So I don't see why we should be sending more postcards than what open meeting law requires because most people are doing what you did. Yeah, yeah no, right. With their postcards, you know, they put them in. Right. The no, sometimes we don't have a quorum or sometimes yeah. the applicant doesn't show up yeah. and we continue yeah. it and you like, People who are interested came to the meeting because they know that's when it is, and they're here, and they hear the new date and the new time, and right. that's okay. their. When I'm in this position as an applicant, I would never come. I would just say, "Let's." I would continue it. I wouldn't waste my time coming to a meeting that I know I'm not going to get. Yeah, I'm all right. That, you're, you're, that's so, you're, you're, but that's up to them. Yeah, I mean, they waste you're, their time more than you're right, anyone. You're right. Well, and there are instances where I think that it makes sense. Like we knew a little bit ahead of time that just wasn't going to be ready. 
you know, we'd say, you know what, let's not waste anybody's time at all. We'll just, you need to, but the board would still have to come and vote to continue it because that's the official notice. Sometimes yeah. that's happened and we've yeah. had a room full of the that's neighborhood required. here and I, they're looking really? out for the applicant and we've got to say, whoops. I'm not sure I've seen that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure it's yeah. So I, I think that's all of our administrative chores tonight. Who was, to close public. Who was recording us from the front row? Um, that was um, Adam Cohen. He lives on North Street. Yeah. Okay. So just send it. Oh, someone it's in the neighborhood. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Toast. Uh, is that a motion? To typically, it would be appropriate to say, "Hey, I want to record this," but what's done my hair? Uh, I move to adjourn the meeting. Is that what you're asking? Just a second. Right. Motion's been made by David Whitehill, seconded by Jana White, and to adjourn the meeting at 9 12 p.m. this Thursday. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye.